following preview was begrudgingly approved for all audiences. You're listening to Elevator Music. Welcome back to Forward Thinking, presented by the Professional Collegiate League. I'm Ricky Vellante, and I'll be joined by my co-host, David West. As usual, we'll be welcoming guests, challenging the status quo, doing social good, and bringing about positive change to the world, while also talking a little bit of sports. Specifically in this episode, we'll be joined by two special guests. First, CEO and founder of Power Forward Sports Group, Luke Bonner. Luke will be discussing his work related to athlete empowerment, more specifically talking about his role in the unionization efforts at Northwestern, and his work related to protecting the name, image, and likeness rights of college athletes. Second, we'll be joined by NBA veteran and athlete activist, Etan Thomas. With Etan, we'll be talking about the Black Lives Matter movement, social justice initiatives within the NBA, the NBA restart, and how we can continue to work towards positive reform societally in the U.S. I'm proud to say that both Luke and Etan are PCL advisory board members whose beliefs and voices continue to help shape our league. If you haven't already, be sure to like and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and the PCL YouTube channel. You can also get more information at thepcleague.com slash forward thinking. We hope you enjoy the episode. And welcome back to Forward Thinking. We have another special guest joining us today. PCL advisory board member, founder and CEO of Power Forward Sports Group, and former professional basketball player, Luke Bonner. Luke, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. How are you guys doing? All good. All good. Thanks for joining (laughs) As good as can be. Uh, So Luke, for our audience members that may not be familiar with you first, give us a little bit about yourself and your background. I'm sure everyone already knows who I am because I'm very famous. Um, but my, my, my background is in basketball. I'm from a basketball family. You probably, your listeners probably know my, my sister uh, better than me and then my brother um, and me as well. But I grew up the youngest of three kids. We all played uh, high level Division One basketball. I would say, you know, we're a family of NCAA poster for success, so to speak. And I went on to uh, play professionally, uh, mostly in Eastern Europe and in the, the NBA D League as well. My, my siblings, my brother played in uh, the NBA for about 11 years. Uh, former teammate of David West. That's kind of how the connection came to be, actually. Uh, my sister also played high level, coached in college, and now she's kind of on the, the NBA front office track. Uh, with the Orlando Magic, uh, where she's the director of player development, and and now I'm got into advertising, became an entrepreneur, started a new business in the the sports realm, and getting invited to talk on very popular podcasts like this, you know, every week now. That's great. And for those that may not know, Luke Bonner is actually the person that made the connection to David and brought him <laughs> to the BCL once upon a time. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sorry, David. <laughs> no, <okay. laughs> <laughs> he no longer takes Luke's calls. Uh, so, <laughs> so Luke, you're you're obviously a very passionate guy. You've you've come up in sports and been within it professionally now, post your playing career. In particular, you've honed in on the college sports space, reforming that name, image, likeness rights, and in general, just being an advocate for athletes. What was it that sort of drew you to that beyond your your personal experiences as an athlete? Yeah, I mean, a big part of it is kind of the unique circumstances I grew up in from a, you know, lower middle class family. No one wants to say that. They say everyone thinks they're middle class, but realistically, probably fell in that bracket. And my brother and sister were, you know, all American level players. My sister started going to, you know, Nike All American camp when she was in seventh grade. She used to go play in Europe with like the under eighteen. There wasn't a women's team at the time, but there was like an unofficial Team USA kind of thing. Playing all, all the top players. Same thing with my brother. Like I'd go to the Concord, New Hampshire YMCA, and you'd see like Billy Donovan, Mike Shashevsky, Jim Calhoun just sitting in the corner of the gym with Tara Vandeveer and Gino Ariema. It's just like how I grew up. And that was really cool. But then there was kind of a point where, you know, they both went on to play very high level. Uh, When my brother was at Florida, you know, they were a perennial top five team in the country. But I still, I was back at home, you know, in in high school and middle school. 
and still feel seeing like the burden uh, of of basketball kind of really going on to my parents, you know, to kind of take care of a lot of things. Like I remember my brother had his knee scoped in Florida and it's, we don't have any family in Florida. It's like, how are you going to get him care to recover from that without violating NCAA rules? And then go see the doctor for follow-up appointments and all that stuff. Like we couldn't, can't afford, you know, another, you know, a thousand dollars to fly down there for those sort of things. So kind of like seeing that paired with tens of thousands of people, you know, in arenas watching my brother play on CBS on a Saturday afternoon from a very young age, I just always had a really hard time kind of reconciling those two things. So then, you know, for me, when I, I, I went to West Virginia, originally transferred back to, to UMass. So I was fortunate to graduate early and, um, enrolled in a sport management grad school program. And that was kind of like a pivotal time for me because I actually, I took a course on, on like college athletics policy with uh, Glenn Wong, who's, you know, a very well-known uh, figure in, in the space nationally. And I also took some sports labor law classes with Lisa Master Alexis, also, you know, very well, well-known uh, professor. One of my classmates was actually Kobe Altman of, uh, <laughs> you know, now the GM of uh, the Cleveland Cavaliers. Cavs, yeah. But yeah, but but through those courses, that's when I kind of realized, like, holy shit, this is really messed up. Like, this system is just, like, completely messed. Had I not had that experience, I don't know that I would have gone so far as I have kind of since then. And so I, I began kind of digging into it more. I connected with uh, Ramogi Huma, uh, who, you know, founded the, the NCPA, the National College Players Association. We actually I, I teamed up with him and Kane Coulter to co-found the College Athletes Players Association. And we attempted to unionize uh, Division One athletes and that, you know, that didn't really work. And then, you know, over the course of time, connecting with Ricky, Ricky with you and, and with Andy over the years and being introduced to, to the, the PCL model uh, was, was pretty eye opening to me because something I always kind of referenced from the start when I was like kind of researching these things and writing about them and talking about them is that, you know, one of the solu- solutions is is reform, right? true reform in college athletics. The other is a third party competitor, right? Emerging in the marketplace is going to correct it and right the wrong. I like 10 years ago, I would have, the, the marketplace option wasn't an option. And so as you guys kind of built this model and progressed, and then one thing leads to another, then David comes on board and, you know, step by step by step, I, my experience on pushing for reform kind of ultimately led me to re, like kind of feel that that's really not a path. Like it's 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 never fully going to happen within the, the the walls of the NCA. Therefore, the only way to to fix this uh, this issue really is, is through an outsider. Yeah, one of my I think back to a particular conference we attended at Harvard, where the there was a series of athletic directors and Tom McMillan, who heads up Lead One, which is a representative body for athletic directors in FBS, and they said that they had done no market research on the value of name, image, and likeness for athletes. Given your current day job with Power Forward Sports Group and what you're doing to empower athletes from the standpoint of monetizing name, image, and likeness and athletic reputation, how many athletes do you think it really will affect versus the the three to four athlete thing that we constantly hear from from athletic directors and coaches? Yeah, it's the craziest thing to me is like that's that's the – the response you hear from athletic directors is one, this is only going to impact the top 1%, right, of athletes. And then the other piece you hear is like, this is going to hurt women's sports somehow. Um, and this is going to hurt uh, our athletic department budget, which makes no sense because name, image, likeness dollars don't come from an athletic department. And even if it did kind of dip into a sponsorship pool, so to speak, there's tertiary benefits, right, of like, the outside sponsorships like jordan brand is not an official you know nba sponsor like like some of these brands that are not official nba sponsors but do a lot of things with nba players that promotes the nba and ultimately has a net positive impact on the game and on the league um so to view that that as like zero sum is just it's fallacy it's it's made up the other piece is saying that this is only going to impact you know the top one percent is a very narrow, uh, extremely offensive viewpoint in, in, in my mind. You're uh, essentially saying that no college athletes possess any sort of value as human beings, like let alone, you know, endorsements and all that. What people, I think what a lot of people don't realize is like the, the name image likeness rules in, in the NCAA are like far overreaching beyond like getting a few dollars from a brand for a, an Instagram mention, right? It's 
it, it, it covers like everything. And even if, it, if something you're going to do isn't necessarily in violation of name, image, and likeness, everything you do has to go through compliance. So generally, like if there's even a doubt or, or, or it's unclear, and generally you're just not going to be allowed to do it just because like the school, the university is not going to want to take on the risk. So, I mean, it's like, it's like anything. It's like if you're a college basketball player and you're going to do some basketball lessons with kids in your neighborhood, you're not allowed to promote yourself as a college basketball player. And, and so by, by, if you were to kind of remove, lift that, it's going to positively impact every friggin' player on the planet, like, like in, in college basketball. Like if you're the, if you're on, you know, the University of New Hampshire men's basketball team, you might not be shit in like the scheme of the world, but where you're from, you very well could be the shit, right? And so to, to say that, you know, this is only going to impact those top 1% is, is, is ridiculous. And the other piece of that is the, all the language around guardrails and in, in fair market value and all these, those are made up terms too. And it's just, it's, it's further just watering down any of the actual change, right? Again, so the NCAA has been very successful, I think, at garnering some positive PR on the messaging around this without actually taking any sort of action. And so yeah, it's it's just one of those things, again, where I really think it's like it needs to be something outside of that world to really drive meaningful change. I mean, on the on the fair market value side, there, there are already companies and things like that that are that are looking at well, what is the fair market price for Trevor Lawrence to post a picture uh, with your product on Instagram? I, my background, like I, I worked in advertising. I ran plenty of influencer programs. I've run dog influencer programs. I can tell you there is no fair market value. The value is whatever someone's willing to pay. Um, and they're, and they're always, it's always different. And it's always, you know, there's, there's different reasons why uh, a brand might be willing to pay more for the same exact thing in one moment than another. And I'll give, I'll give an example of this, that like the way that people don't really think about this is let's say you're a consumer packaged goods brand. I'm going to get a little nerdy here, but I think it's like important. Um, and you're trying to break into a big retailer like Target, right? And, and if your product gets on the shelves in Target, that's going to change the world, right? For, for you as this, you know, whatever deodorant company or whatever. And so as part of that, you have to arm your retail team, right, with with sales tools to to convince Target it's a good idea to stock your shelves with our stuff. Here's why, and there's going to be a full on packet and plan around why that's a good idea. Part of that is like that you're going to market the product, and so if you can go into that meeting and and show like, look, all of these influencers are going to post about the product on top of you know all the paid advertising. Like it, it's a piece of that puzzle. So if you catch a brand that's like they have different reasons for needing that, they may be willing to pay more money, you know, in one time in, in that instance, if there's something kind of strategically behind the scenes going on that they need a boost for in that exact moment. So to say, to try to set market caps or fair market value on these things, I think is, is going to be extremely detrimental to the athletes. Is there any part that's salvageable? Of the NCAA? Yeah, I mean, from what you're just des- what you're describing, what you're laying out is a completely different path. And I'm just being a dev- plain devil's advocate here because that's what we hear um, is like not the whole thing, guys. Right. Like not all of it. And even some of the uh, NBA guys who are trying to work within the framework of the current system to change it. I think we find ourselves getting frustrated with some of these guys sometimes because they're not they're trying to salvage some parts of it. So I'm asking you, are there any parts of it that are salvageable? Of college basketball as, yeah. as it exists today? Right. So, I mean, the thing you have on, on your side with, with like the NCAA is, is you have over, you know, you have over a hundred years, right. Of, of right. tradition and history and whatnot. And, and you have built in audience, right. At, at the universities i think the only potential here but it just never seems to play out is that i am 35 years old now right and i played in college basketball in the generation when the billion dollar march madness deal got signed right so you now have a generation of players my age your age who are coming into kind of some of the 
decision making positions. Right. So maybe that could lead to something, but it's just such a big thing that there's just I just don't see a path for for the NCA to be able to move quick enough in any sort of way and keep up with like the modern world we live in. But I guess that is one piece is that eventually some of the 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 olds, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> are going to move on but right. the way that i mean you, you see it in basketball like they the rules even of college basketball are completely different than anywhere else right. in the world right. and this is I, I think it's a, a hindrance even to the game and the player development yeah. big time it's it's a big reason why a lot of the older coaches can keep winning doing the same stuff from 30 years right. ago that you would get smoked with right in the NBA right. today <laughs> um so i i mean I'm not sure. I know there are some good people. There are good people in college basketball too, but it's right. like there's like this systemic thing that I think it's like just way too big to 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 tackle. Right. Right. So I don't know why pe- people get so upset about this like concept of like. Right. Well, we we'll just a lot have of athletes a have like guilt. Even. Yeah, you you feel guilt or something too is like right. maybe an NBA player because you made it right. Right. I I didn't. I would have loved to have got paid a couple hundred bucks to write, you know, the the blog I wrote for UMass.edu or whatever. (laughs) Luke, one other question along those lines. Some like to tout that, you know, what we're seeing right now in terms of decision making around coronavirus and the pandemic returns is the continued shift towards the conferences having more power. (laughs) But I guess my big question around that is when you look at the people that are running these conferences. Like when you look at Greg Sankey, is Greg Sankey any better than Mark Emmert? I honestly, like I don't even pay attention to, I don't even know what a conference commissioner does to be honest. Um, I'm not even sure. Like there's all these, like they've like created this system where everyone can like point to someone else. Right. And then therefore like nothing happens, but no one's ever to blame. Um, yeah, no so that, let's, yeah, yeah. I mean, even with like player safety, it's insane. Like, we're in a freaking pandemic and still punishing teams for amateurism violations. <laughs> who gives a shit right now, right? Like, right. or who gives a shit ever, but like, especially now. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely, I think you're going to see like true colors kind of coming through because it's also an opportunity for, for athletic departments to have a crutch, right? To, to make decisions that they may want to make, you know, but you can blame it on a pandemic now and, cut certain sports and things like that, even though, you know, if you actually look at the, how an athletic department operates, there's a lot of other areas you could cut. And there's a lot of benefits. uh, If you read any of Andy Schwartz's articles on having so-called non-revenue sports at basically at at like 90 plus percent of universities. Right. Yeah. It's uh, for, for those that aren't familiar with Andy's work, basically the argument is that the majority of the non-revenue generating sport athletes are paying the schools when they come right. into those schools because they're only receiving partial scholarships. So therefore, the revenue generated from those spots, if you're not at full attendance, which most schools aren't, then, you know, it, it's kind of like the hotel theory. You can give a discount to a room and you still make money rather than the room being, in, <laughs> you know, so it's okay. it's the same thing with college athletics and with university, uh, the overall admin of a university. If that spot isn't already taken by a full paying student, and you give it to an athlete on partial scholarship, you're still generating money from that athlete. Right. So that's that's a great rundown of things, Luke. We appreciate it. <laughs> so so what are you up to these days? Obviously, we alluded to power forward sports, but uh, yeah, work you continue to do to, to empower athletes. Yeah, I mean, I, I started a new business right before Armageddon hit, and it was <laughs> it was oddly okay timing. It's kind of worked out, but we have a a lot of a lot of movement coming coming down the pike and it's kind of right in line with everything we've been talking about i I mean i'm essentially like putting my own livelihood on the line backing up kind of this this philosophy but uh yeah power forward is going to be i mean it it is a platform where basically athletes are going to be able to monetize their their name image and likeness by kind of taking control of their their own brands um in a you know, basically essentially risk-free manner. So most even professional athletes don't have, you know, many or any endorsement deals in place, even like in the NBA, right? A lot of guys don't get endorsement deals, but our platform is going to basically allow athletes to, to build their own, what we call athlete to consumer brands and products um, and kind of activate a larger, 
a larger fan base through all that stuff. And so this obviously would have a direct tie into, uh, you know, the name image likeness reform happening in college athletics as well. My last question, what are your thoughts on the restart? On the NBA and WNBA restart? Uh, I haven't thought too much about, I mean, I think it's risky. I think it's risky in obviously the health sense from a public health perspective, but I also think you run the risk of kind of people not caring as much because of everything else that's going around, you know, around the world, basically. So it's like either people are going to be way more into it because there's nothing else going on, or you're going to kind of realize like, like, why do I care about this so much? How have you sort of adjusted to this pandemic? I mean, for me, I'm one of those people like uh, that. I, I was working at a big ad agency that was like a day job you know, kind of thing. And then I started my own, what I would call a boutique sports marketing shop. So I've, I've been working home, from home for a couple of years now, kind of anyway. And right. I mean, I'm, I'm very well aware, like I'm very privileged to be kind of where I am too. Where I live we, hasn't really been hit that hard from like a, a numbers standpoint. Obviously, like everyone's been hit from like... Right economic and all that stuff um but i mean for for what i'm doing now it's actually been i I feel awful saying this but it's been like a pretty okay stretch right right no all good i understand most most people don't I, i feel like with this disease still like most people don't know someone directly yet that's like suffered from it And so I I feel like every day, like, you know, just like everyone else, like just like the weight of that, like just expecting someone you really care about to have some bad news or whatever is is always, you know, there. And my last question would be, I guess, circling back to what you, your point about sort of what you're doing now with athletes. What, how do you find athletes to be in terms of their reception when you start talking to them about name, image and likeness rights or talking to them about their brands? Do you find guys are interested? Do you find it's something that, you know, you feel like you're introducing the concept to them? Is it something that they're already aware of? Where do you find most guys sit in that? Yeah, I think a lot of a lot of the athletes are really interested in it, but not totally clear on how to activate in a right, way that right. makes sense for them. Okay. And I think that's been the solution that we're able to provide. And and part of it with what we're doing is, you know, there, there's, there's, there's strength in the numbers um, in having, you know, people involved, but it's, it, it seems like something a lot of athletes are very much interested in and right. not just like, not just like, you know, David West putting out a David West t-shirt, right. That's like a caricature of mm-hmm. you or something, but like really, you know, like you've got the, the Carolina t-shirt on right now, right. Like, like putting something stuff out that's like, really meaningful uh, to, to your authentic interests and maybe has nothing to do, you know, with basketball at all. Right, um, right, right, right. And so it's been, it's been, it's been really cool already. And, you know, we have a ton of traction, so excited to see where it goes. Good deal, man. Well, Luke, we really appreciate the time for those that want to want to check you out on Twitter and all where, the, where can they find you? You can find me at Lukey Bonner, Lukey baby, right? Uh, <laughs> I promise it will be an entertaining follow if you choose to. (laughs) (laughs) I apologize in advance. (laughs) Well, we we appreciate it. You uh, take care, stay safe, and uh, thanks again for coming on. Thanks, guys. All right, thanks. Thank you all for joining us. We have a special guest today, NBA veteran, activist, author, poet, motivational speaker. I like to call him a, a social commentarist, one of the one of the uh, bright minds we have, uh, and especially proud of his brother because he comes from the NBA fraternity and we linked through the game of basketball. Eton Thomas, uh, thank you for joining Forward Thinking today. No, thanks for having me. And much respect to you too. I mean, we, you know, we've, you know, bumped heads a little bit, bumped shoulders and everything during the league. <laughs> right, right, but right. then really seeing all the stuff that you were doing afterwards, you know, we, I remember bumping into you at the Congressional Black Caucus and just, you know, right. I had to stop and I'm like, hey, much respect. I see what you're doing. You know, right, keep right. doing it. So, you right. know, and then what you're doing with HBL and everything like that, I think is, I think is great. So much respect to you too. Absolutely, bro. Absolutely. We, um, we usually like to start these conversations with just getting, 
a little bit of background on our guests. So just for our listeners, give our listeners a, a background uh, of you and, and sort of your story. Okay. Well, I went to, uh, grew up in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. I was born in the heart of New York. Moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma when I was younger. So that's where I grew up. Um, I went to Syracuse University for four years and then um, played 11 years in the NBA, uh, mostly with the Washington Wizards. And, uh, you know, there's there's something, you know, I started writing when I was in the league. You know, that's just something I started doing. Now I'm like, about to start my fifth book. So I, you know, just had a, had a passion for writing. You know, I interviewed David West for one of my books, but We Matter, at least an activist, and had, you know, a lot of respect for him uh, as well. So I, I think that one of the things that we're seeing right now is that you're seeing an explosion of athletes using their voices and their platforms. And right. this is something that I've been really, you know, passionate about and pushing for for a long time, you know, because it's my passion. Now, the athletes that I grew up admiring were like, you know, Muhammad Ali and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Bill Russell and John Carlos, Muriel Abdul Roof. Those are the athletes that I, you know, grew up uh, admiring. So I know the power of the athlete voice. So it's wonderful to see how athletes are using their voices now. Like, I'm just, you know, I, I couldn't be happier with it. And right. you know, it's, it's just, it's a special time right now. Right, absolutely. What helped shape you? Uh, what moment uh, was there in your journey? You know, I know you said you were born in Harlem, moved to Tulsa. Uh, I know you've been in D.C. a very long time and become very active in the D.C. community. What helped, what helped shape you? I mean, when was it that you said, OK, I'm going to be a basketball player to a point that I'm not going to neglect sort of this other side of me? So where was that moment for you as, a, as an athlete and on your, along your journey? So first I became, you know, I had an awakening in the seventh grade. That's when I read the autobiography of Malcolm X. So when it's interesting, when I talk to the, about people about that, that grew up with me, they remember it's like, it was like a switch. Like, you know, I grew up, I, I, was, I was one way. And then after the autobiography of Malcolm X, I came out and I was like a totally different person. You know what I mean? It was like literally a switch. So then once I got to high school, you know, I started getting into speech and debate because I wanted to write speeches on about different things like Malcolm did and talk about you know, issues like Malcolm did. So I was doing speech and debate. So then I had an incident that happened um, my sophomore or junior year of high school where I got stopped by the police on my way to a uh, basketball game, right? There was a big rival game against Central. Those like, that was like one of our rivals in a busy part of North Tulsa uh, where I live, uh, right in Pine and Peoria. You know, if any of the, you know, your audience is from Tulsa, they know where Pine and Peoria is, right? So, so I got stopped there. And back then, what they would do when they would stop, you know, especially black men, you know, back in the 90s, they would make you immediately get out the car and sit on the ground. You know, they don't do that as much now. But back then, that was like routine. You already knew that was going to happen if you got stopped. You was going to have to sit on the ground, at least in Tulsa. So, you know, they had me on the ground. The backup came. Then the backup to the backup came. Then the backup to that. And so those four police cars, lights all going all over the place. And they thought that they saw me on a mugshot. So they were running my, my plates, running my thing. They're like, no, let's keep looking. You know, and so a, a police officer, while I'm on the ground, is sitting there, you know, with his hand on his gun, waiting for me to make a move, you know, just an intense situation, right? So after 45 minutes, it turned out that they recognized me because I played basketball. And my name, my picture was in the papers, not because it was from a mugshot, because they found my Booker T. Washington bag, you know, in the trunk. Which, you know, later on I found they weren't supposed to be able to go in my trunk without a warrant. But, you know, we're, you're young. That's what happened. Right, right, right. So what I did then was I wrote a speech about it. It became my original oratory. Original oratory is in speech and debate. You, you uh, speech that you make, that you create of your own. They're, you know, standard oratory, you're reciting somebody else's speech. And original oratory right. is you create your own. So I wrote about that incident. And I talked about the bigger picture and about how... As a, as a black man, I'm perceived and I go to games and the crowd is cheering me dunk and everything like that. But then I, you know, I'm driving in the street and the police treat me like this. So I did all these connections and the uh, speech, you know, I started winning a lot all through. I took it all the way to, you know, from regionals, nationals, everything like that. They wrote an article in the Tulsa World about it. You know, I got a letter from the police department saying we're going to look into them, uh, you know, uh, to the incident. Like all of this stuff happened from it. So a lot of people were coming up to me like, hey, thanks for saying this. You know what I mean? Like, thanks for, for speaking this. Because this happens all the time to us, but don't nobody want to hear when we say it because we don't hear. So that's when I made the connection. It was like the, the light bulb went out, like the, you know, the, the um, Oprah Winfrey aha moment. I was right. like, wait a minute. They just 
paying attention because I play basketball. That's the only reason. I was like, okay, I could use this basketball thing, you know what I mean, to, to get my message out. And I started reading about, you know, reading more about Muhammad Ali and reading about what they did and how to use uh-huh. it for platforms. So that's what birthed it for me. So from that point on, I kept using my platform. Nice, nice. And I think, um, is there, is there, was there a point where you ever questioned your intellect as an athlete? So I know, you know, my background is completely different from yours in terms of <laughs> academic focus. But, but you know, in the university, I think a lot of times, if you're a guy in school and at you know, higher learning, it's accepted. But then when you move into the NBA, there's a bit of a stigma attached, right, to being too smart or a guy who knows too much or maybe a know-it-all. So how were you able to navigate that, meaning that sort of, you know, having your own mind, you know, being aware of things outside of sort of the basketball world that kept you and gave you a different focus that isn't necessarily common in the NBA. So how were you able to deal with that? So interesting. So when I came with the Wizards, that was when MJ, you know, came out of retirement. So I spent my first two years kind of just watching. And there were a lot of vets. Okay. I mean, we had Oakley, we had Popeye Jones, Byron Russell, uh, Leitner, um, Jerry Stackhouse came the next wow. year. Wow. So it was all it was all vets. And I saw how they interacted with different rookies, different young cats, right? right so, right. you know, I watched how they were hard on Kwame. You know what I mean? They were hard on Kwame. Right. Um, you know, Oakley didn't like Brendan. For whatever reason, I don't know why, they, he didn't like <laughs> You know what I mean? Right. Um, they were hard on Courtney Alexander. They thought he was a little mm-hmm. too cocky. You know, so, so I saw mm-hmm. that. But with me, you know, even dealing with MJ or Oakley, they always had this respect for me that was like, okay, I see that you're into different stuff. And they would just ask me questions every now and then. Cause I, you know, so I was quiet. You know, if, if you in, if you're in a room with MJ Oakley and then you, you, you're best to be quiet if you're young. Right, guy, right, 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 right. I'm sitting there really just chilling, listening and learning and watching their, you know, how they do and everything like that. And, you know, sometimes they would come up to me, Oakley would come up to me on a plane, like, Hey, what's, what's that you read? You know, so I would right. sit down and chop it up. You know, right. MJ would pass by. I remember one time I was reading uh, soul on ice. I'll just okay. right. Right. So, so MJ, you know, hit me. he was like, I know that book. And I was like, oh yeah? And he was like, yeah, no. He's like, my, my father, you know, knows about that book. And I remember him reading about it. And then we sat there and started chopping it up. And then wow. he told me this story, and I'll never forget it, about something that he did where there was this 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 um, golf club that wouldn't allow, you know, they have unspoken rules where they don't really let black people join a golf club. You know what right, I mean? Right, right, right. But they was cool with MJ joining it. So mm. MJ was going to have this big event there and he was telling me what he did, and he was like, yeah, so right before the event happened, I was like, well, you know, I'm going to cancel everything if you don't change your policies and start accepting black people into your club and actually, you know, correct the wrongs of how long that you didn't allow black people right, right. to come to the club. And then I was like, oh, that's dope. I was like, why you don't tell nobody that? You know what right. I mean? Because then they had a, I was like, a lot of people would like to hear that. And he was right. like, nah, young fella, I, I don't do it for that reason. So we would, so we had this connection. So it was like right. this level of, you know, respect that I would always have from different older players that would just kind of come to me kind of quietly sometimes and ask right. me something. You know right. what I mean? Right, 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 right. That's so I didn't, I didn't have any negatives there. It was always like, like this was your thing, and I respect it. It might be a little bit different, but you know, they came. I mean, Gilbert would come to me. I remember having a long conversation oh. with Gilbert about the political process because he didn't understand. He was like, "Wait a minute, what is this electoral process? I don't get it. What's going on here?" Uh, and we st- we chopped it up for like the hour and a half, right? You know, we was in a um, hotel in Milwaukee watching the um, the election process with President Obama, right. and he was like, "What is this electoral vote? I don't get it." And, and I explained to him. He, I was like, "That's what it is." He was like, "That doesn't make any sense." He's like, "Why?" Well, so we had this deep political talk. So we would have political conversations a lot. Mm-hmm. And so when people would say, "Wait, Gilbert Arenas had political conversations," I was like, "All the time." You know what I mean? Like y'all saw a certain side of Gilbert. I would see a certain side, a different side of Gilbert. Gilbert is sharp. He's intelligent. You know, he mm-hmm. likes to play and joke around a lot. But you know, and that's what I would see. I would see different sides of guys that kind of like they don't let everybody else see sometimes. Right now, was that ever an issue? So why why are guys not willing to show their uh, what would you call it uh, their no make statements no there's a def- there's a specific reason why and guys would come to me I remember one time being on the court and you know a couple times like I remember Street from Dude Raheem said something to me Ben Wallace says guy just saying hey 
you know, I love what you're doing, man, but you got to be careful, man. You don't want to get done mm. like Craig Hodges. You know what I mean? You don't want to get like my little <laughs> dude. Oh, guys would tell me that all the time. Right. Like when I say, so there's a reason why, and that was specifically put out there by David Stern. There mm. was a reason why you don't have a lot of guys in a certain era um, really speaking out. Because, right. and, it's, and it wasn't necessarily that David Stern was against the topic. He was all for um, marketing. And he didn't want to do anything that was going to affect marketing and affect the bottom line. So when, when that whole thing happened, because I was on the, I was part of the union and part of the negotiating team, you know, mm -hmm. on the executive board. And I remember when we went into a lockout right after the thing with the, um, the brawl with the Pistons happened, yep. right? I remember. So the right. only thing that they were concerned with was perception right. of what would affect the bottom line. So they're talking about the dress code. They're talking about, right. at the time, I didn't see it. At the time, I was like, Billy, like talking to Billy Hunter, why, why are we agreeing to this? This is like offensive. They want us to right. put on suits so we don't scare the white people away? Like, what is that? And he was like, no, no. But he was like, you got to understand they're worried about perception. Now we could go on the other end of what they're not worried about and get more percentage of BRI, basketball related income. We could do right. this right here while they're worried about that. You right. know, and so I was like, okay, I, I, I guess I get it, but it's still messed up. He was like, it might be messed up, but this is the way that we can come in here and now get what we have to do. So, so he didn't want for fans to now be scared away you know, because of everything with the brawl. And, but I took it personal, but it wasn't mm. personal for David Stern. It was just business. So mm. when he didn't want athletes to speak out, it wasn't even about the topic. It was that he didn't want to do anything to affect the bottom line because he thought if athletes do speak out, that's going to affect the the, the uh, mainstream America and they're not going to tune in more and that's going to bring the bottom line down because the viewership is going to, you know, that that's what he thought. Now, right. I, I looking back on it, and I don't have any evidence of this, but I really think a lot of the reason why guys back in that era, in the MJ era, were quiet was mm -hmm. because that's what that's the, the the culture that David Stern specifically created and said that put in their heads that that's what he wanted because it would affect their their bottom line and the league's bottom line. But now you got guys like LeBron. It's a different era, so guys have now understood that no, they don't nothing affect their bottom line. They can say whatever they want to. So you have right, guys right. like LeBron. And so you have LeBron being the top person saying it. Now guys everywhere under him is going to say, oh, well, if LeBron can speak out, cool. I'm now everyone is speaking out. And it's right. beautiful to see. But that's why I that's why I think you didn't see that back then that it goes to right, right to David Stern. Now Adam Silver is different. Right. Adam Silver has the, taken a different kind of a path with it as far as now he might have a lot of similarities as far as bottom line which we could even talk about later with why we're even in the bubble situation right now. Right. You know what I mean? It's for economic right. reasons. But if you're talking about as far as guys, you know, using their voices and not trying to kind of squash it because he thinks it's going to affect the NBA overall bottom line, he's night and day from David Stern. How much of a, of a watershed moment, Etan, do you think it was with, with Adam Silver's handling of the Donald Sterling situation? And, and obviously, we don't know how David Stern would have handled it, but how important do you think oh, that was for sort of the shift well, in the culture of the NBA? Well, we know how David Stern would have handled it because Donald <laughs> Sterling was Donald Sterling for a very long time. Long time right, so right. if you go even further back to where to his his dealings in California as a slumlord, not a landlord, but a slumlord, right? And he had the highest amount of discrimination lawsuits against anyone in California. That is who he was. Right. You know what I mean? David Stern knew that. He didn't say, okay, this isn't somebody who should have a team. This isn't somebody who should represent the NBA. He let, allowed him to be that person and continue on being in the position of having the Clippers even though he was running the Clippers the same way he was running his his you know apartment complexes and stuff like that in LA as a slumlord, you know, so it was it was bad for the league. So so he had been Donald Stern was Donald Stern for a long time. Now Adam Silver came in, and that was like right when he had you know taken the reins and been right. commissioner. Right. So that was really a key moment to how he handled that, and he listened to the players. And he listened to, you know, I remember seeing it and I, you know, I interviewed a lot of the players about this topic in my book, We Matter, at this actually. And I interviewed Jamal Crawford, who was on that Clippers team, and asked him about how everything went. He was like, honestly, they went to Adam Silver. 
They said, okay, we don't feel comfortable even playing in this situation. We don't want to, you know, do this. And they were like, he said, Adam Silver said, okay, give me three days to do my due diligence. Just give me three days. And then I'll have a resolve right at the end. He said, but the players were ready to boycott. They were like, no, we're as a whole, we were all ready to boycott. That was the conversation. Actually, you know, Jamal, Jamal said, even the, the Warriors reached out to them and said, hey, how do y'all want us to handle this? This is what Jamal told me in the book. He said, because we're staying with you. And we try to, you know, this, this is messed up as well. I remember who was, I have to look back to see who specifically talked to, but the Warriors as a whole, you know, everybody was on the same page. And Adam Silver did his due diligence in the three days. You know, but in the middle of that, they had the game to play. So that's when they took the shirts off and everything like that. So everybody was like, in the, in the country was like, oh, that's whack. Oh, the players are whack. I was like, no, they're handling this the way they're supposed to. In three days, and that's why I even wrote an article about it then. I was like, no, y'all don't know what's going on. They're not whack. They're not, you know what I mean, being soft or being or whatever y'all are calling them. You know, because people are using strong language about them without knowing all the facts. And so Adam Silver, after that, you know, he, he, he forced Donald Sterling to give up his position, say he was banned for life. And that statement of him standing at the podium and saying, you know, it's his decision that Donald Sterling will be banned. And then he said, for life. That right there showed that there was a different chapter happening now from the old regime to the new regime. So then you had players who had a certain level of respect for Adam Silver because he actually would listen to them. Now, if Adam Silver handled that situation the way David Stern probably would have handled the situation and smoothed it over and not said anything and just said, everybody just go back to business as usual, then you would have a different level of friction you know, with players. So that was a very smart move business-wise, from Adam Silver to make. You know, I'll say that. But also, since then, he has he has been consistent of saying that, you know, players have the right to speak, you know, almost encouraging players to speak out, encouraging players to speak their mind and take stances on different things and stuff like that. So in that, you know, I got I to gotta get him up to him. Got to tell him much respect for that. Yeah, I definitely will, will, um, will second your sentiments because I think the way that Adam handled the Donald Sterling case in particular, and then some of the other stuff that's happened, mm-hmm. um, you know, just him him adjusting to the times and adjusting to the to the evolution of the athlete, um, right. and really coming out of that uh, what I what I call a stagnant period in terms of mm-hmm. ath- you know athlete because you I mean someone that I don't agree with you know and I've been public about this and you know we had Charles Barkley talking you know trying to diminish the role that athletes actually played in the in the lives of young people right we know that the things that we say the things that we do as as black athletes can more easily be relayed to young people of course. right and he knows that and yeah. he tried to diminish the impact that athletes could have and i think it was it's always been something that's that's bothered me because i say well yeah technically your role is not to be a role model mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. the way that society is the way that our young people are they're going to look to people that they admire for what they do to inform them in other parts of their life and Mm -hmm. it's our responsibility to have something to contribute to them right we can't just say hey uh, it's not my role that's not my duty so i think that that you know the down sterling moment and we had again we had some you know i said we had some all lives matter cats hopping there but Mm -hmm. that's fine too because at least we know and people are able to see that this dynamic exists, you know, amongst athletes. So I definitely, definitely back up your points with that. What do you think right now? We've got police brutality on the, the hinge. We've got, you know, we're on the back end. I'm not sure how many years it's been now since Colin Kaepernick first uh, kneeled in protest to police brutality. We've had mm-hmm. countless public cases and trials, and in my opinion, miscarriages of justice where we don't even mm-hmm. see cops arrested. We've got this at our plate, and we're still talking about, we haven't even mentioned the coronavirus and this mm-hmm. whole pandemic and the moment that we're going through as a country. Where do you see things headed? I mean, wh- where do you really feel like things are headed? And then also to couple that, where do you, what role do you feel sports plays in this current context that we're living in? 
So, you know, to answer this question, so I, I in, in my book, We Matter, Athletes and Activism, I, I interviewed a lot of different athletes who have been using their voices, right? From the past into the present. And it's an honor to be able to do that. People from like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the people who I named, mentioned that I grew up admiring, um, you know, Bill Russell, John Carlos, you know, Mahmoud Abdul, Craig Hodges, I interviewed all of them. And I interview current athletes, athlete, um, activists who have been using their platform, you know, like as yourself, you know, Russell Westbrook, D. Wade, you know, all that. And then I interviewed family members of the victims of police brutalities. And that that has really molded my mind as far as what needs to happen next. So I've been working with Eric Garner's daughter, Emerald Garner. Uh, Terrence Crutcher, who was killed in, in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, his sister, Tiffany Crutcher, Valerie Castile, who's Philando Castile's uh, mother. So I've been, I interviewed all the Javaris Fulton, who's uh, Trayvon Martin's brother. So I interviewed them in the book. And they've all gone on this quest to change the laws. All of them. Every single one of them in their respective cities and their everything like that. I mean, uh, Ms. Sabrina Fulton, who is uh, Trayvon Martin's mom, um, is running for office. You know, they all want to change that way. Uh, Eric, Emerald uh, Garner, you know, just got the Eric Garner law passed this, uh, like maybe maybe a, a month or two ago to say that it was it's now illegal for a, for an NYPD officer to use the chokehold that Daniel Pantaleo used to kill her father. You know, right. um, Tiffany Crutcher is pushing and, and I always quote her with this. And she says that you can't legislate somebody's heart. Mm. But you can change the rules and the laws. So even if their heart isn't right, they can't act on their on their bias and their racism. Right. And if they do, they will be held accountable for it. Right. So now, so their push is now to change the laws and the statements of Black Lives Matter and, you know, different organizations saying statements. And, you know, every everybody for a while will say different coaches, different. Everybody's saying the Black Lives Matter. OK, that's all cool. And I'm not taking anything away from that. That's all great to, to, to show your solidarity. And right now we're at a time where, and you tell me if I'm wrong with this one, I probably see more white people out protesting the, the death and the murder of a, of a black man by the police than I have ever seen in my life right, right. now. Right. You know, so, so while we have this, we have to push for more. So what I like is what Kyrie Irving um, proposed where he said that, okay, we want to put, you know, the statements by the teams are all great, but now we want to push for teams to use their power in the respective cities where they are to actually have influence on police departments, which right. they definitely can. You can't tell me that Mark Cuban don't have influence on, on the different politics and things that go on in Dallas. Ted, Ted Leonis is here in, in D.C. You know what I mean? You can just go down the list. So, you know, statements are nice, you know, but we don't want to go fall into, you know, what Malcolm X talked about is meaningless gestures and being confused with actual progress. Oh, yeah. You know, that's not that's not actual progress. So 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 pushing for teams to use their power. And that is something you know, there's there's so many different facets of police reform that can easily be implemented to hold police accountable in police departments. Now, it's not federally ran. So each one is held differently. So that's why I like Kyrie Irving's suggestion so much of not just leaving it up to the players to say something and then the organization move, but the organization as a whole say, okay, we're going to use our position and our power and our influence, and we're going to request that these police departments in our cities, you know, where we have influence, install some of these, these police reform um, policies that would help policing in that city, whether and each place is different. Some places have body cameras. Some places don't. You know what I mean? We still have certain police departments that have the ability to turn off their body camera whenever they want to. Well, then that defeats the purpose of even having a body camera in itself. You know, you have different police departments like in, in Tulsa where where um, Tiffany Crutcher is pushing for to say, because this is what Betty Shel Officer Betty Shelby did on the stand when, when they asked, OK, why did you have to pull out your weapon against Terrence Crutcher? Did you feel threatened? Did you see a weapon? Did he impose immediate threat? All she had to say was, I was in fear for my life. That's it. She just had to um, keep repeating that phrase and didn't have to show any kind of connection because in, as, as the laws state, that's all a police officer has to say. Mm -hmm. So now Tiffany Crutcher is saying, okay, no, we need to push that language. That's old, archaic language. And now they have to show actual proof, 
actual reason of why they had to brandish their weapon, of why they felt the need to, to be in fear for their life. And if there's nothing that they can prove, you know what I mean? Then they have to be held accountable. And right. that holding right. accountable, that police accountability will help everything. Because right now, even if it's just the appearance that the police could get away with murder, they can do whatever they want to. They have a license to kill. And that's not even a logical way to police. Like we all have ch children. I see you got the little hoop in the background. We all <laughs> children. If we told our children, listen, you could do whatever you want to do. You know what I mean? And you go and investigate yourself. And you come to me and tell me if you did something wrong. Nobody would do that as a parent. Right, right, right. <laughs> Nobody. It doesn't even make sense. So right. why would we have police officers have to, when they do something wrong, investigate themselves and then come back and tell us if they did something wrong or not? That does, that's not even logical. So every time there's a police killing, it should be investigated by an outside entity that has nothing to do with the police department. These are all common sense things. That's like if a, like if a, um, a player gets injured and they go and get a second opinion because they don't want to get the doctors at the team doctors and go straight from them because they can kind of, you know, they have a different right. agenda. So they want to get a second opinion. That's like how we should police. You don't have the, the, the investigation team be employed by the police department. Right. They're going to say what you want them to say. Right. <laughs> so right. it's just stuff like, so we have to focus on changing laws and changing legislation and holding police officers accountable. That has to be the next step because if it's not, and they just have a license to kill, then all the, there's going to be another George Floyd in, you know, in a little while. Right. It's just going to keep going. Right. They're going to keep, they're going to keep killing. I mean, yeah. to, to just make it plain as, as day. We have, um, you know, we have a, a real issue in this country. There are some nations where the police force hasn't used deadly force in 50, 60, 75 years. Right. Um, it's almost, right. and we have a consistent use of, uh, in my, in my opinion, uh, mm -hmm. force that's unnecessary. And it's specific, right? There was an FBI report that came out that basically it said that police police forces around the country have been infiltrated by white supremacist groups. So we know that there's an element in policing that has an intention uh, in terms of how they police and how they over police black communities specifically. But one of the more interesting things that I have heard in the last few weeks or months is this idea of policing, not so much reform in necessarily it's the way you hire, right? So the people who are on the police forces in these communities have to be from the, the communities. And people have been making this right, have been making that argument that if people are invested in living in the community that they police, that will have different outcomes. What, what, what is your idea about that? Oh, not even a question. I mean, I, I live in Prince George's County, which is an right. upper class, you know, um, black county. And we have that. We have police officers that we pass and they go to our church. Their kids right. go to our school. You know what I mean? Like we, we see that and the whole interaction is different. You know, when I grew up, when I was younger, that's the situation that I had, you know, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, we had a group. Now we had another group that was still coming in of police officers who weren't part of the community, but we had a group of police officers. And they were the Black Cops Coalition and mm, okay. we all knew them. They put on different events that my mom would take me to, you know, right at Central High School. And she would drop me off and be like, okay, what time do you want me to pick them up? You know, and take me and my brother there. And they would talk to us about, you know, staying in school and, and not, you know, not doing drugs and not with gangs. Right, and stuff right, like right. That. But they would have those discussions with us. So we, and we knew them and we saw them. When we were out at Quick Trip or at, you know, the park or anything like that. They would call us by name. Mm -hmm. Like they know us, know us. So it's completely different. So right now what you have is police departments that are treated almost like you're on foreign territory, like you're going to Fallujah or you're going to Iraq and they're coming there and they're in enemy territory. And the whole way that they move is like they're trying to, you know, suppress and control the area. That's a totally different way of policing. But right. the thing, the issue there is that you don't see that in the white suburban areas. That's right. not the way that they police them. That's not the way that they treat them. So then they say, okay, we don't know why there's this negative relationship between the black community and police. I'm like, well, have you seen the way that you've interacted with police when you come into the right. black community? Right. Like that, right. Right. How else would that be? You know, I mean, you're coming with and dealing with like kids and it's like they're the enemy targets. Like we just, like me and my kid, my son just watched um, Predator 
And you saw, you know when the predator sees the enemy target and it's like green and it's like do, 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 do. Right. that's right. how they're looking at our kids and treating us. So so of course that's not going to have a, a environment that is a healthy environment for a relationship between the two. And that's not even what you're interested in. You're interested in, you know, it's not serve and protect. Right. It's like control. And what, you know, what does Trump say all the time when he, you know, gets on the mic? And Giuliani and the language that they use, they're right. saying law and order. So right. law and order is speaking to a specific thing. You know what I mean? You're not saying that for the for the white suburban communities of law and order. You're right. saying right. that specifically for us. Those are the dog whistles that aren't even dog whistles. You're being very direct to what you're saying. And, and, and that, you know, that's the problem. But you, when you have the president of the United States, you know, on the mic championing it, you know, every time he gets a chance, then you can't be surprised when you see video. I mean, I, I was saying after, I was like, wow, have the police gotten more aggressive after George Floyd happened? Because right, it seemed like right, there was right. more issues coming on. You would think the opposite would have happened, but it was like right. there was more. And if you see it at the protest, they, they're coming and they're just, you know, it's just like, and you hear the accounts. And this is the thing. You're hearing these accounts now from white allies. And they're saying like, wait, we were here. And then the police came and they just came in like with these Gestapo tactics. And they were like, you know, like with, you know, and they're fully funded with like they're in a war on tanks and all this gear. And that's when people started looking at, well, wait a minute. Why are they spending all this money and all this military gear that's not even needed? So that's when you started hearing the defunding the police. So now people started looking at their line items in their city. And they see education as like the 50th thing. And then they see police as like the one, the number one thing and the number that they're, that they're spending on the police. And they're like, wait a minute. Why are we spending all this money on the police? Why right, are they right, right. this level of militarized, you know, everything? And now you're, they're saying, because when people heard defund the police, they, they, I don't know, I guess they thought it was abandon the police or something right. like that. We're like, well, no. Defund and abandoning are two different words. I'm not saying that the police aren't needed, but why are you spending so much money on militarizing them? Right. Like they don't need all of that. Where well, you right. could be having those in education and mental health and all these different issues that could actually help the community of where you live. Now, if you're not interested in helping the community, then you would have a system of a system that we have. You look at it's so funny listening because you listen to Trump and he's talking about education. I'm like, as a, as a country, we're like the bottom of the barrel in the world of education. Right. You know what I mean? But we don't invest in it. So there's right. a reason why. But you invest in the, in the police department. And that's why we have, yes, the strongest, the biggest, the you know military, all that. Because that's what you invest in. It's like it's not rocket science, you know? Man, appreciate again, Etan, having a great conversation. What, let's talk about you know this current COVID uh, climate and the pandemic, and um, you know, first, you know how you and your family reacted to it and dealt with it. But then, secondly, you know you've written a letter to Adam Silver, an open letter to leadership of the NBA, saying, and you've been very vocal about this, about no need to rush back into sports at any level. So can you just give us um, give us your thoughts on this current climate and then what what motivated you to make that statement about the NBA specifically, but then in a broader sense, sports in general? Well, it's interesting because I had just, you know, we had just put out a, a interview that I did with Adam Silver for, you know, the show I, do, I have called The Rematch of Fly TV. And I had to sit down with Adam Silver and, I, you know, I was so impressed by it. And we talked about so much stuff about activism. We talked about China. We talked about, you know, so many different things. And I left the interview with so much respect for him. And one of the things that he said was, you know, it, he, he values people's opinions. And it value, he values that we might not agree, you know, but we can, we, I can still, we can agree to disagree. But, you know, you, I value your opinion as an athlete to be able to voice that opinion and he created an atmosphere. And I was really applauding him for creating that atmosphere. I asked him a very specific question. I said, if Mahmoud Abdurraouf and Craig Hodges would have happened under your watch, would they have been punished? And I was so impressed with his answer. He was like, well, I didn't see any reason why they should be punished. He was like, Craig Hodges giving a, you know, giving, you know, writing a letter 
you know, and, and voicing his concerns through a letter and giving it to a staff member at the, you know, at the visit with the White House. He was like, that's about as respectable, respectful as you could possibly be. He was right. like, so no, didn't see it. I was really impressed with that. So it was interesting because right after that, I was like, well, I'm looking at him on this, I'm talking about Adam Silver on this press conference, and he's talking about the bubble idea. And then I'm looking at Florida as being the epicenter right now, which it has become, of coronavirus cases and hospitalizations. And every statistic that dealing with the coronavirus, Florida is like number one in. And so I was like, well, of all places, why are they going to Florida? You know what I mean? I'm like, so, so I'm looking at the different, you know, plans. And, I, you know, the MLB plan I thought was, was terrible. Um, I was looking at a hockey plan, and they're going to Canada. And I'm just looking at different things. And I was like, eh, I don't know if any of this is worth it right now. So I, you know, I coach my son's AAU team. Shout out, FBCG Elite, Dynamic Disciples. And so I coach their team. So back in February, March, I shut down everything. I was right. like, listen, this is not worth it right now. I talked to all my parents. I was on social media. I was like, listen, I don't know what other programs are doing, but I care about your kid's safety. And my own safety as well. So we're going to pause everything until further notice. And that was kind of my, my position. And all of my parents were right on board with me. I didn't have any issues or anything like that um, or objections. I had like some of the players come on my show and they're all on board and everything. So I was all set. But as I'm going, I'm seeing the coronavirus cases get worse and worse. <laughs> you know. And then I turn on the news and I see Trump saying something completely different. Trump saying that everything should open, encouraging all the states. Now, you know, my family's you know, still in Oklahoma. Oklahoma's a red state. So Oklahoma opened. So while I was saying that I'm going to shut down everything for AU standpoint, all of my friends, my boys who have kids there in Oklahoma, they're opening up AU and they're opening up, you know what I mean? Youth soccer and youth fo uh, football and everything like that. And I was like, yeah, no, we're not doing that. So, so, Fast forward, a lot of them have had to then shut down youth sports because they've had spikes in coronavirus cases right. with, with, with kids or throughout the soccer league or throughout everything like that. So all of those that, that rushed to open now shut down. So then I'm watching Texas, I'm watching Florida, watching Georgia, all these places that opened up, I'm seeing all of their cases spike. So I'm like, hmm, I, this, this doesn't seem like it's a good idea for us to have this <laughs> And so I'm, I'm processing it. And, you know, I love basketball. I'd love to see, you know, my son's favorite player is Giannis. That's his dude. You know, so he's, you know, he's built like him. He's tall. My wife is tall. So, he, you know, he's tall. But it's a different game now. So guys that are they're tall, they don't be making. They're not like how, you know, I play. They, right, they, right. they want to play on the wing, bring the ball up. You yeah. know what I mean? Euro step all over the place. Right. And stuff like that. So he loves Giannis. So he would love to see him compete for the championship, you know what I mean? And, you know, he loves Kawhi, he loves every, everybody excited about what's going on in the Lakers, everything like uh -huh. that, so I get it. But I'm like, this isn't safe. I'm like, I don't know why, why are we doing this? So then I saw different players test positive. You know, and of course, you know, recently, Russell Westbrook announced that he had tested positive. But then I saw the reports from the different doctors, and this is the NBA doctors, of saying that they were concerned about the long-term effects of players catching the coronavirus on their lungs. Right. And it's just a big unknown. Like, we don't know what the long-term effects are. So now I'm looking at, and then, so I'm looking at at colleges, which I think is completely absurd for them to, you know, bring football players back on campus when the whole college is shut down because they want them to get ready for the season, which is a whole different issue. Um, but I'm looking, and I, and I just came to the conclusion. I was like, I don't think any sports on any level needs to happen right now. So I wrote a you know respectful letter, open letter to Adam Silver, and I just kind of made my case. And I said, I understand it for economic reasons, but you know Adam Silver has too much integrity to do something solely for economic reasons. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and in my opinion, I don't, I don't know if I'm giving him too much credit or what, but you know that that's what I stated. In, in the letter, and I and I do believe that. I said, you know, it, you know, Trump is one person. We know what Trump's focus is. He wants the economy. He wants economic reasons. He doesn't care about anybody's health. That's what this thing is. He has the elections coming up in November. You know, his whole thing is economy, economy. Even though we know that the economy boost was back during the Obama administration, and they kind of rolled the wave of that and kind of claimed 
that it was all because of his policies. But that's neither here nor there. The economy is at an all-time, unemployment is high. Everybody knows that's connected to the coronavirus, but it is what it is right now, right? So we understand why Trump wants to push for economic reasons for the economy to get back into place. That's why he did the stimulus package. We want to get, you know, go back and spend money. We got to get a bounce back. We got to be able to get the economy back. I understand it from his standpoint, right? And I also understand that he doesn't care about, you know, people's actual lives. Right. And I said, Adam Silver, you're not him. You know what I mean? And I don't believe he's him. So I, I said in a the, in the, in the letter, you know, you're a man of integrity. You have had this, this history so far of responsible leadership. I mean, right. his, and I, and I talked about it where Adam Silver's decision to shut down or suspend the, the NBA after Rudy Gobert tested positive, it set the tone for all other leagues. Because right. then you saw the NCAA, then you saw the MLB, then you saw NHL. Every That all started with Adam Silver. If Adam Silver would have said, you know what, I think we're okay. We're going to figure out how to do this. We're going to other leagues would have been influenced by that. So right. Adam Silver having the, the, the moral courage to say, no, we don't know what's going on with this. We just had the situation where we're going to suspend everything right now. And then that caused a domino effect. So now with this bubble idea, He's giving other, is having the adverse effect. So now they're saying, okay, well, if the NBA does this successfully, now we're going to try. So then you're going to have AAU, all down to the AAU, peewee football. You're going to have high school, middle school level, because they're looking at the NBA as the model because that is the position that the NBA is in as being the model of, of responsible leadership. So I was just kind of urging him and making the case of why this isn't a good idea. And the the good thing that is that he at least at least used the language. This is another area that he separated from Trump. Trump said everything needs to start regardless. I just posted this video from uh, two days ago where the people the lady said uh, the guy was telling Trump, "Well, we've had deaths with with teachers. This one teacher passed away. This happened. You know, children to be more susceptible to." And his response was, "Schools must open." That was his response. That was what Trump's immediate response to him was. Adam Silver was at a press conference and he said, well, if, if the numbers keep rising and, and the community and things like that, we're going to have to reevaluate everything right, right. now. Right. We're comfortable where we are, but it's not full steam ahead no matter what. And I quoted him in saying that in my open letter. And I was like, that's good. But right now where we are is pretty bad. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, the numbers are in our second wave. All the experts, Dr. Fauci is saying, now, of course, there's you know, things, there's questions about Dr. Fauci's allegiance and things of that nature, and I get that. But all the medical experts are saying the second wave is coming. Regardless of how to handle it, they're saying the second wave is coming. We know that we don't know the long-term effects. We, we have athletes right now who are testing positive. We have a, a wave of different, you know, athletes from even the college. You had 30 guys on Clemson, you know, 15 guys at um, – at uh, Maryland football team, at LSU, all these different guys connect. And we don't know the long-term effects. So I think the responsible decision to make is to be just suspended. That's all. There's no reason to even do it. I mean, it just pick back up in the spring if things are all, you know, cleared and a little bit better situation at the spring. But to do it now where, where coronavirus cases are soaring, where hospitals are like overflowing with people, you know what I mean? Where you have, I mean, these are these are facts. I know sometimes the, um, Trump likes to try to debate facts as if you know certain facts aren't debatable. The fact is that Florida set the record of most coronavirus cases of all states this weekend. That's a fact. You know what I mean? There's nothing to debate about. That's a fact. So when you have that type of environment, it, to me, it doesn't make sense from a not from an economic standpoint. But from a coronavirus pandemic standpoint, it just doesn't make sense to have any type of gathering of any level right now in, in our country as a whole. Yeah. And we haven't we haven't proven that we could that we can handle this thing the way other nations have handled it. Because I saw right. some I think they're back to playing baseball in Japan already mm-hmm. um, with fans, but they basically had like eleven cases of this thing of coronavirus. That's right. That's exactly. Different. Exactly. They shut down like back in like February, March, they shut it all the way down. Like, so us here in America, we had, well, 
if this county wants to shut down, but the next county doesn't want to, okay, the view over here, so that the whole way that we shut down didn't even make logical sense. Right. And I understand, you know, in this country, the way it's set up, the state rights, it's like every state in certain instances is like their own little country. You know what I mean? And they can do things the way that they want to do. I think during a pandemic, during an unknown pandemic, you kind of got to have different rules. You got to have certain things be kind of federal, just universally. Like everybody needs to shut down for right now until we figure this out. That's my opinion. I see other countries did that and I see them rebounding now to where they're almost right. back. To right. And now we're waiting for the second wave to come in. You know why we have all, why we have people actually protesting, having to wear a mask. You know what I mean? So it's just, that's not a logical way to handle a pandemic. In my right. to add, I think it's it's a bit unfair because like New Zealand, you know, they have they're back to having games with full stadiums because yeah. because yeah, they've they're eliminated all of their cases. You know, the, the UK, the Premier League, Bundesliga in Germany, you know, all these different leagues that have been able to come back. But that's a result of the national response to the pandemic, which is yeah. something Adam can't control. You know, in, in defending him, he can't control how the states and and the country responded to this. Yeah. Now, all of that said, I do want to go back to one thing that you mentioned, and I want to dig a little bit deeper in terms of the college sports reaction versus the professional sports reaction. Yeah. No. <laughs> in, in, in regards to the NBA, understanding there's still an imbalance of power between the players and the league owners, but at least, sure. you know, each body has its own representative element, being Michelle and Adam and having the ability to negotiate return mm -hmm. to play protocols and all of these things. You don't have that in college sports. And, and so I guess getting to my question is, in your opinion, so taking your, your team's reaction from AAU and your reaction too. So kind of everybody kind of fell in line because you're like, hey, we need to do this to protect everybody. In college sports instead, you have this normalization of risk for athletes, mm -hmm. especially in football, you know, whether it's concussions or now coronavirus. How important do you think it is to address changing the leadership within college sports so that that normalization of risking the athlete is addressed? Oh, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I mean, even, listen, even going back to after Rudy Gobert tested positive, the NCAA still didn't want to cancel anything. They wanted to keep going with March Madness. They forced their hands when different conferences started pulling out. But the NCAA was like, okay, let's try to. Mark Emmerich didn't make no announcement. He said, we are, we are looking at options. That's what he said. And so, you know, he like, we're in the middle of March Madness. We, this, we, we make a billion dollars just for March Madness alone. We're going to try to figure this out. And if it weren't for the conferences pulling out, they would have tried. That's not even, that's not even a question. And it's mm -hmm. not even saying that, you know, I think they would have tried. They said they were going to try. <laughs> <laughs> they made that crystal clear. And the thing about it is even the way that they're handling right now, as far as if you're, if you're going to tell me that the entire campus is shut down, there's no summer school going on, there's no anything like that yet, and, and this is right now in June and July, right? We're, we're in July. But you're going to bring the football team back because they're your, you know, uh, revenue generating sport, and you're going to put them at risk, and you're going to be okay putting them at risk as if they're a professional team. So if everybody, if no students, if they, then you want to make the case that says that, you know, we're, they're all students and they're student athletes and, you know, one athlete can't, one student athlete can't get any, you know, anything different than a regular student because they're all equal. So you make that case there of saying why you can't pay them, right? But here, and, and when you're talking about the coronavirus and a pandemic, you want to bring them, bring them there and have certain protocols to try to make it work to have your season, right? So the other sports that are not non-revenue generating, they're not focused on them as much. So a lot of the, the non-revenue generating sports have suspended their season until the spring, which is, which is, and so now you have the main revenue generating sports, which is usually football and basketball, football they're practicing right now. They have no argument to make that they are completely and solely, and solely economically based the way that they're handling their student athlete, which is really their employee that they don't have to pay. And so the entire system of the NCAA and how they are operating needs to change completely. And this right here is almost like, 
exhibit A, you know what I mean, of why yeah. they need they need to change because they're operating as if they are a professional team. Right. They wouldn't bring any any regular students back. It's not like the English department is coming back right now. You know what I mean? To be able to yeah. have classes. No, just the football team. And then on top of that, you have the football team having outbreaks of coronavirus cases. Right. So you have all the evidence that you possibly need to say, okay, for the safety of our student athletes, we're going to shut it down. But they haven't done that. They said, okay, we're going to move them to the side <laughs> and then we're going to keep going, which is absurd to me because if, if they tested positive, that means all the different teams, the whole team that has been practicing with them have now, you know, yeah. it, it's... I the whole thing operating right now is just absurd. And yeah. the, the thing about it is I think it will expose a lot that should have been exposed already, right. but even, even reinforce the way that their entire structure, like you just said, needs to change. Yeah. The, at Carolina, I think it's 39 players yeah, tested yeah. positive like last week. They shut down, but they simultaneously brought the basketball team yeah, on campus sure. while they were shutting down. Yeah the football guys for the COVID outbreak. So okay. it's um, it's very evident and clear what folks are, what folks' motivations are here um, in terms of this outbreak. Where, where do you, with all that's going on, social environment in this nation, different issues that this nation is facing, you know, this, this sort of coming to grips with racism that I think is probably the most important conversation we have to have as a nation. Where do you see some hope where do you see a bright spot? I'm just, I'm just curious. So I think, I think the bright spot is that people are using their voices more to point to things that are wrong. And where they would flip the page or scroll past it or not say anything now, now you're seeing people, you know, you're seeing even articles being written more and exposing what, what's going on. I mean, you're seeing, you know, I'm not, I'm not the only one calling for it or the NBA not to have a season. Right, um, right, right, right. Are, are questioning, like, wait a minute, is this what we should be doing right now with all of it? You know, so so people have a a more sense of being able to use their voice, and it's so interesting because, and I've asked myself this question, and I've been asked this question a lot: what makes George Floyd's murder different? Mm. And that's a, I still haven't gotten an answer for that. I don't, I don't know because you had you had different murders where you know by the police that were on camera. You know, we right. watched. Eric Garner get choked to death on camera, screaming, I can't breathe. You know what I mean? We, we watched all of that, uh, and, and it was on camera. What makes this one different? And I don't know. You know what I mean? To be honest yeah. with you, I don't they, and it's in, in its level of, of evil, there's been other ones that have been so vicious and so heartless right. as well. So I don't know what changed with this one, but right now, the light at the end of the tunnel is that people have uh, a a different, newfound level of responsibility to call out things that are wrong. So that's why you're seeing different things. I mean, we're right here in, in D.C. with the Washington football team. I mean, literally, yeah, since I've come here, I, I, I came here in 2000, right? That has been an issue that I have been seeing here all, you know, all over D.C. for 20 years. So before when I well, before I came here, you know, since like the 50s or 60s, that has been an issue of, of trying to push them to change the name and everything like that. Now you see a different level of, OK, we're going to force you to change the name or you're going to be affected economically. People taking it to a whole different level in a different degree. So there is a bright side of saying, OK, well, people are starting to see. And I'm hoping that it translates to then police departments. Because you're saying, okay, this worked here. If you could get Dan Snyder to have to change the name, something that he was hell-bent on not doing no matter what for like so long, you could force police departments to take um, and adopt different police reform things if they're going to lose some of their funding if they don't. Because that's what moves the needle. You know, when you affect someone's bottom line, when you affect them economically, then then it's like they're Ebenezer Scrooge. Then they like, you know, like they've seen the ghost of Christmas past and now they have this, right, 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 right. you know what I mean? Everything. And they want to right the wrongs that they've had and we'll take it. But that has to be the strategy that has to be put towards a lot of different things is that it will, we will, you will be affected economically if you do right. not 
You know, that has to be, and that's that's what moved the needle with Donald Sterling. That's what moved the needle with Dan Snyder. That's that's what changes things. Yeah, I'll just say my opinion on why George, George Floyd, this case is mm-hmm. different. I think it's just because people we were coming out of this out of this standstill moment. I think, you know, we were sitting still for three months. People were thinking more and didn't have access to the sort of normalcies that we have in our everyday to day lives. And then it's like, okay, we're going, we're, we're slowly, but surely trying to reintroduce ourselves to some kind of normalcy. And then bam, this happens. I just think it was a very polarizing moment. Everybody's attention Right. Was we were sort of anticipating something and we were probably anticipating something positive. Right. Because this was a time I know for me, you know, I've been you know, we got a one year old and I was never able to spend a whole year with my other two kids, with my other two babies. They're 14 and 11 because that was in the NBA. So it was right. like, OK, they're born. I'm on the move for their first year of their life. I'm in and out and really all of their life. And this is the first time being home for two straight months, three right. straight months. Right. It's never happened before. And um, I just think all of that uh, is what sort of polarized the moment. And people were just, people have just, in honest, in all honesty, I think we were, we were closer to a, a human state. And so in terms of what our normal lives were, like I said, closer to your family, closer, thinking more intimately about the relationship you have with your family, because, you know, you're thinking about mortality with this pandemic. And then all of a sudden we see this callous, intentional taking of someone's life. And I right. thought it just it just brought all of that into focus. And I think that's why people responded the way that they responded. That's a good point. One of our previous guests, Wendell Pierce, so sort of on a on look forward basis, he talked about how the social justice movement of the 20th century was political rights and activism changing legislation to be recognized rights that should have already been recognized. But he talked about in the 21st century on a go forward basis, it has to be about economic development and opportunity, especially right. for minority communities. So I'm just curious as to your thoughts on that take and how important it is for these communities to have that economic power to cause change and, and meaningful change going forward. No, I definitely think it's important. I mean, there's a we have a list of things that are that are important right now, and that's why I really, you know, I, and I understand that people are are disheartened with the whole voting process. Believe me, I get it. But right. really, locally, that's where things are really policies are really changed and affected right. at the local level. You know, right. you have the ability to put in place and have an influence on who the police chief even is. You know what I mean? Like who the the, the judges. Uh, yeah, the judges, you have the, the school, the school system, you don't right, 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 right. when you talk about the school system and the way and the policing that goes on in the school system, oh my God, that's all a different topic. We could talk about that for a whole other hour. You know what I mean? Because the way that that happens, it's like they're treating them like they're prisoners, right? right. And, and, they're, and they're middle school and, and high school. And so, you know, that's really where you can affect a lot of the different change. I think one of the things that happens is that in local elections, there's such a low turnout. And if you look at the percentages of turnout in each local elections, you'd be surprised. I mean, it's it's in the teens. You know, I mean, that is low. So, you know, when people have to really understand the the amount of influence they can have where they live, when they're involved in the local elections, you know, in particular. And that can also translate to Everything that we just listed, where you're talking about economic development, uh, we're talking about police reform, uh, we're talking about educational uh, standards, and you know, you're talking about everything. All of that, you know, can be implemented in in local elections. But if you're quiet and you don't push for these things, and you just kind of like, you know, when they don't happen, you're like, why is this happening? You have to be able to understand where you can have uh, influence and influence change. And I can't say it enough. That's really in the local elections. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. I 100% agree. I believe that voting locally um, allows you to impact your life more specific and your Mm -hmm. day-to-day life more specific. Even down to, you know, how many handicap spots are in certain parts of the community. I mean, serious serious stuff. So, Etan, it's been great. We really appreciate the time. Very thoughtful. 
we know our, our listeners and our viewers will be uh, be informed, and we appreciate your time and, and, and joining us. Great. Appreciate you too, man. Keep doing what you're doing, and you know, I'm supporting everything you're doing, so Absolutely. just keep it posted. Absolutely. Thanks, e -Town. No problem. No problem. Thank you for listening to the latest episode of Forward Thinking presented by the Professional Collegiate League. We hope you enjoyed our guests, Luke Bonner and Etan Thomas. Forward Thinking is hosted by David West and Ricky Vellante, produced by Rafa Hernandez, Brito, Wendell Haskins, and Ricky Vellante, with the music done by David West. If you haven't already, be sure to like and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and the PCL YouTube channel. You can also get more information at thepcleague.com slash forwardthinking. In the meantime, stay safe, and we'll see you next week.